Today, we're going to take a look at data binding as a way to save data. This means that all the data you want to persist is known all the time, making saving your game state very fast. Data persistence, in my opinion, is something you should think about near the beginning of any project. Not only is it much easier than trying to shoehorn it in near the end, but it will also help you create better data models. We'll build a save load system first, then we'll apply it to a player as well as an inventory system. Let's take a look at a diagram. So the hub of our system we'll call the save load system. It has two dependencies, or rather, it has one dependency, the data service, which has its own dependency, a serializer. Now we already have two things in our game, a player and an inventory. But what we want to do is have a central game data object that contains player data as well as inventory data. Now we're going to bind the player data and the inventory data to the player in the inventory so that that data is always up to date, ready for us to save, load, delete, delete all, etc. And then our data service will handle putting it into a file, serializing it and whatnot. And that's really the gist of it. So let's start with interfaces first. Any class that implements our iSerializer interface is going to need to know how to serialize and deserialize a type of object. I'm going to build this under the assumption that we're going to save everything as JSON, but we can extend this in the future. Likewise, we're going to have an iData service that's going to be responsible for saving our data in a particular location. We'll default the override to true, so we'll override existing saves. Then we're also going to need a load method that will return our game data. And we're going to need some other helper methods so that we can delete a save. And maybe we want to delete all of our saves. And we probably also want to be able to produce a list of all of our existing saves so that we can show them to the player and let them choose later on. So let's make concrete implementations of both these. Let's start with a JSON serializer. Just needs to implement those two methods. Now there's nothing very complicated about a JSON serializer. These are just one line operations. We could extend this in the future to add some encryption or some other type of serialization. Now our data service is going to be a little bit more complex with five methods. So I'm going to call this one file data service, and we're just going to write this data locally. So I'll implement all of the members here. Any data service that we create is going to need its own serializer. So let's have a private reference to that and we'll pass it in with constructor injection. Let's have a few more variables for data path and file extension, which we might want to modify in the future as well. For now, let's just create a constructor that accepts one parameter. Maybe we want to inject the other ones later, but for now this is okay. We'll set our data path to be our application persistent data path. Likewise, we can have a default file extension on copilot suggesting .json. I think that's okay for now. Then we can add our reference to the serializer we've injected. And I'm going to add one helper method here that's going to help us combine paths together. So we'll, using the path.combine method, we'll put together the data path, the file name, and the file extension together so that we can easily get this without having to repeat this code over and over. Let's have a think about what to do in the save method. First of all, let's get a reference to that file location using our helper method. Then we can say, if we're not allowed to overwrite, but the file exists there, let's throw an exception. Now, let's assume everything's good after that. We can just use file, write all text into the file location, and we'll call our serializer's serialize method on the data. And that's it. That's all we have to do for saving. Load is basically going to be the inverse of that. Again, let's get a reference to our file location. Then let's make sure the file actually exists at that location with that particular name. And then we can return the serializer's deserialize method just by, again, file read all text this time on the file location. Our other methods in this class aren't too complicated. Delete, get the file location. If it exists, use file delete on it. Delete all, almost the same thing. This time we can just use the data path, grab all the files there and delete them all. Be careful with this one. You might want to have a look in that folder and just see what else you're storing in there. Then add some validation if necessary. Then for our last method, we can actually enumerate all the files that are in a particular directory. So we can check at that path. And then we'll just do a little bit of validation here because we really only want the ones that match our file extension. And then we can just return them as an I enumerable. So let's have a look at the class that's actually going to show up in Unity for us. I'm going to call this save load system. And it is a mono behavior, but I'm inheriting from our persistent singleton. I'll put a link to the singleton video here in case you're not familiar with that. Basically, it's a singleton that doesn't destroy on load. I've got a serializable data class here just called game data. And all it has right now is a name that we'll use to represent it in the game, but also as a file name. 
We're also going to need a reference to the data service that we're going to use. Now, because I'm inheriting from the persistent singleton class, which has an awake method, I'll create an override awake method here, call the base awake, and then we want to create our data service. So we can create a new file data service that has a dependency of a new JSON serializer. Well, let's create a few methods to work with our data service here. So we can have a public new game. We can create a new game data object and we can just give it a name of whatever we like. Let's also create a variable to store our current level name. So that's going to be the scene that we're currently playing in. Right now, I only have one scene in this game that I called demo. So I'm just going to default it to that for now. For simplicity's sake, instead of building a whole scene management system, right here, when we fire off new game, I'm actually going to load this scene right from here. All right, I think that's good enough for new game. Let's move on down to save game. There's actually nothing too fancy we have to do here because our game data already knows the file name to save and our service already knows what to do. So we can just call the data service and ask it to save our game data. Load game will be very similar, but we need to pass in the file name that we want to load. Then we can call the data service load method. Let's add a check in here just in case the current level wasn't saved. We can just go with the default again. And once that's all set, we can load the scene. The last few methods are very straightforward. If we want to delete a game, we're basically just going to pass through to the data service. We can implement similar methods for our delete all and list all in the future. Right now, I'm just going to turn this into an expression body method. Then I think I'll do the same for the save game since it's a one line operation. And maybe to help with testing, I'll add a reload game here that'll just reload the exact same game we're on instead of having to pass a parameter into the load game method. Now, for ease of testing, I've gone ahead and made an editor class. I'm not going to type it out here. I'll just show it on the screen. This is basically just going to draw the default inspector and then give me some helper buttons so that I can easily save, load, or delete any given game based on the data that I'm using when I'm playtesting. Now, just before we give this a trial run, I did make one typo back in the file data service, and that was, I don't need this extra little period here. I'm just going to delete that. There we go. All right, so I'm going to create a new game object to hold this system, and I'll just call it something like save load, save load manager, that'll do. And then we'll add our save load system right onto here. Now you can see already it's got some of the characteristics of my persistent singleton, but it's also got my three buttons and exposes our game data. So this way we'll be able to see what's going on as we start testing here. Now I forgot to add a new game button in here. So for now, I'll just fill out the name and current level data myself. So we're not saving anything too important yet, but let's make sure at least that it's going to create that file for us. So if I click play right away, you'll see the game starts showing my UI and everything. I'll click save game. Now I'll come back out of play mode. I'm going to jump over to my persistent data path and open up this file so we can have a look at it. So here it is, it's just called game.json and it only has two fields in it right now. It's got our name and our current level name, just like we expect. So this is good so far. Why don't we start saving some information about the player? To relate things that exist in the save file to things that exist in our game, we're going to need to use some kind of identification system. Now, I've created a class called Serializable GUID. For simplicity's sake, you might want to use strings instead, but I like the Serializable GUID class because it lets me do quick comparisons using integers, which is much faster than strings. So when the number of objects in the game really starts to grow, it's a lot faster to be able to reference things by numbers. Now, when we're talking about IDs in this context, this refers to the owner of the data. All the owners of data are going to be issued an ID in our game. That means each player is going to have an ID. The player's inventory will have an ID. All the enemies in the game will have an ID and, you know, and so on and so forth. So the serializable GUID class will be in the repository for you to have a look at and consider. But if it makes it easier, you can start with strings. Just watch out for duplicates. So the iSavable interface will help us relate data to an object in our game. Those objects in our game need to be able to bind that data to themselves. That means each of those game objects needs to have their ID represented, and they need to have a method that will let us bind the data to them. So every game object in our game that's going to be able to be saved will have to implement the iBind interface. Let's jump over to the Hero class and implement that interface here. I've defined the player data here as an iSavable. It's going to have a reference to the hero's ID and position and rotation for now. Then we're going to implement the iBind player data interface, add an ID so that we can identify the hero, 
then we'll also need a reference, of course, to the player data for this hero. Now, because player data is a class, we are passing a reference to this data. So we can say the hero's data is now equal to the data that we're going to use in our save system. That means the data reference we passed in is now the same reference being kept by our hero. Now that we've bound this data, let's make sure it has the correct ID of our hero. Then we can update our position and rotation based on that data. And then from this point forward, we can use update to constantly update our position and rotation so that the data we want to save at any time will be correct. Now let's jump back over to our save system and implement this binding. The first thing we need to do is in our game data, we're also going to now be saving some player data. With that in place in our data structure, let's implement some methods to actually do this binding. If I scroll down a little bit here, I think I'll put it right above the new game method. Now the first bind method is going to assume that there's only one of a particular type. So I only have one hero, I only have one inventory. And what the signature says here is we're looking for a type T that's a mono behavior and implements I bind. And the data that we pass in has to be an I savable and has to be a class that we can create a new one of. Now, as long as we can find one of these type T's, we're going to bind some data to it. And if for some reason our data was null, we'll just make a new one. Suppose maybe it's a new game. So the signature looks complicated, but it's actually a simple method. Let's make a variation on this method that can handle a list of data. Suppose we have many enemies or many spawns of something in the game. And in this case, we want to iterate over all of them and actually look for matching IDs. And then we follow the same process. If there was no data for a particular entity, then we can just give it an empty data structure to fill out. Now let's make this binding fire anytime we've loaded a scene. So let's hook into the scene loaded event. Whenever the scene loads, we'll bind a reference to the player data to our hero. Now it could be that on certain scenes, you don't actually want to do any binding, like your loading scenes or your menu or whatnot. So you could just have a guard clause here that says, you know, if the scene name falls into a list of scenes that you don't want to be binding on, then just return early. Again, at some point in the future, you'd want to separate the scene management from your saving and loading of data. Well, we've done all the hard parts. How about a test and see if we can actually save some player data into our file? If we take a closer look at the inspector now, you can see all of our player data is exposed here. Notice that our player data hasn't been associated with an ID yet, but our hero does have an ID. So when I click play, I expect the scene to load, the bind to fire, and suddenly our player data should have the same ID as our hero. And you can see in the window there that that is correct. And it's now showing our position and updating our rotation as I move around here in the game. As a test, I'm going to save the game. Then I'm going to click new game. That should set me right back to the start and open my inventory window again, of course. I'll just put that away and move a bit. And now let's try loading and make sure I come back to that position again. So that opened my inventory because the scene loaded again, but here I am at the end of this path. It's exactly the way that I expect. I got back my position and rotation. If I pop back out of play mode and let's open up that file again and have a look, let's see what kind of information is now stored there. I expect to see my four part serialized GUID. Yep. And my position XYZ and I've got a rotation as well. This is exactly what I wanted. You'll notice that for my ID, that it's actually serialized my backing field. Now, if you're using strings for IDs, you might see a string here instead, of course, but uh, this is looking good. Let's carry on. We can come over to my inventory class here and also implement iBindable here. Now, if the inventory is going to bind to inventory data. This is a class that I've set up in another file. Let's have a quick look at that. You'll notice some similarities between the player data. This also implements iSavable. It has an ID. It's going to have a list of serialized items, and it's going to keep a capacity in our coins and anything else that we decide that we're going to store as inventory for the player in the future. So back in the inventory class, let's make sure that the inventory has an ID number that we can associate with the data for loading in the future. The inventory also needs to implement the bind method but if you recall from last week's video, it's the model that actually holds all the data. So we're going to pass this through. We've got to pass it down into the controller, and then the controller can actually hand it off to the model for binding. So there's just a few little pass-through methods to implement here. And then once we get over into the model, we can actually have a bind method that's going to perform our various bits of logic here. So it's going to accept our inventory data 
Now we have configured our inventory to have a few starter items. So there's gonna be a little bit of extra logic here. What we wanna know is, is the data coming in about a new game or are we loading an existing game? First, let's store this data into a field. We'll just call it inventory data. And we can also set the capacity in that inventory data to whatever the capacity of this inventory actually is. Now, I need to create a few new fields here. So up at the top, I'll create a new field for inventory data and a new field for capacity. Then let's make sure that capacity has a value in it. We are already passing that in through the constructor, so let's just set it right there. Now, one way we can handle the inventory being new or not is we could just check and see if the data coming in is actually empty. So we could have a Boolean here, let's just say is new. Uh, that would be if the data items is null or the data items length is equal to zero. So if it is new, let's instantiate a new array to hold our items in the inventory data. That way we'll be able to store all of our inventory items in our savable data. Then we can also say if we're new, but there are some starter items already, let's iterate over all of those items that exist in the inventory now and add them into our savable data. Now that we've synchronized those two things, we just have to bind the savable data to our actual inventory items. This way, when our inventory changes at runtime, it's really changing the data that we're going to save. Now, before we forget, let's jump over to our save system and make sure that inventory is an item in our game data. Then we also need to make sure that when we're binding everything up, we're also binding data to the inventory. We can do that right after we're binding the player data to the hero. And that's it. If we jump back into Unity and press play now, you see we have our starter items here and you can see over in the side, it's actually started to populate our save data. So in our save load system, we can see we have a capacity of 20. Our coins is still zero, so we'll have to do something about that but we can actually see our items there. So I'll expand that and just pull some things around and we'll see it change in real time. So now you can see slot two has nothing in it. Now it has two mushrooms. Now it has three mushrooms. Let's swap some things around. So it's looking good, right? But can we save this and is it gonna look correct? I'll click save and let's find out. Now the easy way to test is to click new game. There we go, everything's reset the way it starts as and load our existing game. The three mushrooms are back in the first position. It looks just how we saved it. Let's do something with these coins. This is actually an easy change. We already have coins being stored in our inventory data. So we're just going to use that as a backing field for the coins property. Now, when the coins change in the game, it's really being changed in our inventory data. So now I've quickly loaded and saved a new game. And I just want to have a look at the file and make sure that the coins are being represented correctly. So if we have a look in here, everything's looking good. Let's have a quick look at the inventory. Now, every inventory item has its own GUID. So you can see it's been split up into its integer parts and everything has quantities. Those are looking good. Now we got a bunch of empty slots where there's nothing. And then at the very bottom, we can see capacity 20 and coins 10. So that's exactly what we expect in the file so far anyway, looking good. So I hope that gives you a good idea of how you can use data binding to help with your save load systems. Not only that, but how to extend it a little bit in the future if you needed encrypted JSON, or you just totally wanted to change from JSON to binary maybe, or change to saving to the cloud. None of those changes would be very hard to do with this system. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Next week, we're gonna look into another exciting topic, but if you can't wait till then, click on one of these boxes on your screen and I'll see you there.